So welcome to this run through of a production component where we're gonna apply some patterns and see how it, it changes the code. Now, the message of this video is really about like, when do you apply patterns? We, we often think about patterns as something we apply as we're writing our code. But uh, I've learned that patterns are often more appropriate to apply after you've implemented something. And the reason is that you really know exactly what you're building, right? So you kind of want that playful, just get the thing in, kind of figuring out and exploring. And then when you have the thing working, that's when you uh, apply patterns. Now, the, the person who wrote this code uh, is an excellent engineer. I worked with him for many years. Uh, but we we work in this environment, startup environment, where things has like we have high momentum and things needs to go out and and often like just working on stuff for a few hours, you're really happy when it works and it's good enough, right? There is such a thing as good enough, and this is definitely good enough. Um, but we're still going to use this to apply two patterns: one pattern called the constructor pattern, and then a pattern called explicit states. Uh, but before we go into the actual refactor, we're just going to look at uh, what this component actually is. So it's an upload model page. And as we can see, it manages a, a model that has a source, a name. Uh, we track if we manually change the name. It has a description, a hugging face token. There's an upload mechanism here that can error. We have a success uh, payload based on that upload, but we also get an upload job ID. And that upload job ID is managed by a different component that actually processes the upload and then has its own success or failure. Um, and then we see that we're deriving some state and then we're jumping into some implementation details of how the, the upload is handled where it's changing some state, running the upload. On success, it changes some state. On error, it changes some state. And then we go back and we see some uh, derived state uh, before we get into the actual UI uh, implementation where we're dealing with these different states to show messages. Uh, we have the form itself with some implementation details on how it handles changes to those fields. Um, and uh, a button for actually uploading the, the model. And then if we have an upload job ID, we pass that job ID to a different component that gives us notice when it's completed or failed. And that's basically it. So what we're gonna do first is talk about this constructor pattern. And in this example, it's uh, actually quite simple because we still have all these different states uh, defined uh, but as you can see, there's no implementation details anymore. So from the start of the component to the return statement, it's only about state definitions and derived state definitions. There aren't any implementation details. It's very much inspired by, by classes. So if you think about the constructor of a class, uh, there you typically assign properties to the class instance, right? Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing here. And then the return statement is returning the public interface. Like in this case of a component is a literally a, a UI, an interface, but this didn't have to be a component. This could just be an object that has uh, like uh, certain properties or methods to access the internals of the, the closure here or the function. But in this case, it's an actual UI. And as we can see, as I'm uh, running through this UI, we can see that I'm now um, also refactored the change handlers to just reference a, f a function, right? So basically just remove everything that has anything to do with implementation details. Uh, and the question is like, where do you put it? And we put it after a return statement. So we think about these functions as the methods, right? Of our class. So we start by constructing the, uh, the component with its state and its derived state. Then we return the actual public interface 
and then we have the implementation details or the methods used. Now in a class, you would use like private or public keywords to kind of define what's private and what's public. That's not the case when you just have a function. Like what you return from the function is public, what's not returned is private. Um, and you don't have any disreference, so everything, all functions can point to props, can point to state and other functions, like there's, it's much cleaner uh, in that sense. But that's all I did here. And the whole point of this is that when the next developer actually reads this implementation, what they'll see first is what state does this component manage? What does the UI look like? How does it use that state? And then if I'm actually interested in implementation details of um, event handlers or whatever, I can go and read that last, right? But it eases you more into the, the logic of the component. And that's something that you can apply after you figured out how your component's gonna work, right? Uh, but now we're gonna uh, look at another pattern called explicit states. And explicit states is something you, you wouldn't apply by default. It's something you typically apply when you have complexity in asynchronous flows, which is exactly what we have here, right? Um, and the way our component will look like now is that first of all, we're gonna, instead of having a bunch of use states, we're gonna properly type these explicit states. Uh, so first of all, we know that we have this model and this model is accessible in any, um, any state, uh, but we can only change it in one state and that is the idle state, or at least that's how it's defined now. That, that could change of course, but that's why our idle state um, has, uh, has the model and then it has specific functions for changing that model. So that means that only when we're idle, you can actually go in and update uh, the model. And then of course you can choose to upload the model itself. So what's interesting about this is that explicit states is inspired by finite state machines. And state machines sound so complex uh, and it kind of hides the value, I think, because the value of a st finite state machine is the explicit states, like how you can reason about different states of the UI as a whole, right? Um, and what, But what's different is that if you have a finite state machine, you typically have an object where you describe your explicit states and what events transitions into what other states. So that's a good mental image to have, right? We don't actually have that here. You can't see how we move from idle to uploading, for example. But what we do have is that when you're in the idle state and you consume that state, you know with the help from TypeScript what functionality you actually have in that idle state. And that's not the case typically for a finite state machine. In a finite state machine, when you actually consume it in your code, you can fire any event you want at any moment in time. It's the internal implementation or the uh, configuration of the machine that decides if that event is gonna be handled or not. But now we can actually feel confident when we write our code that, okay, when I actually am in this state, I can update the source, for example. And I find that to be more valuable than having like this declarative description of, I have this state and then this thing is called and then I get into this state. Another thing is that these functions, um, they do things, right? But a state machine doesn't do things. It just transitions into states. So you have to like hook into transitions to do things like, firing a request or something. And that creates um, indirection. So you have to compose in your head, okay, great, I can see these tra uh, state transitions, but what actually happens when that state transition happens? So you have to go somewhere else to figure that out. But that's not the case, the case here. You just name the functionality that's available in each state. You implement the functionality in those functions and you're off to the races.
Okay, that was a long <laughs> winded explanation, so, but let's move on here. So we have an idle state and we can move into an uploading state. During the uploading state, we still have access to the model, but we can't do anything with it. Uh, we might during upload uh, find out that the model actually exists. So that's something I inferred from reading all the implementation details of the original code, because uh, that wasn't an explicit concept, but here it is. Uh, but if the model doesn't exist, a job is required and we still have access to the model, but now we also have a job ID and the only way to move on from this uh, state is that uh, the job calls job completed or, or job failed. Um, one pointer though is like uh, during uploading, there isn't any functionality. So like, how does it actually move on to the next state, right? And that's the great thing here. It's like, as we're gonna see later, is that when it transitions into a state, you're gonna see the code and you can not only run logic by the functions defined by a state, you can also run logic when you move into a state, right? So when we move to uploading, we fire up the, the fetch or the, the uploading request and only that internal logic decides when it moves into model exists or job required or error. Um, and then we have job completed uh, and we have uh, the error state. Okay, so all of these states are super explicit. Just by reading this, this type definition, you understand what this component is gonna do, right? And this is a very complex component. So having this in your brain before you even read the component is useful. Uh, and as we can see, this is the union of states that builds up our um, actual state of the component. So now we don't have all these use states. We have a single, uh, we have a single state where we start in the idle state. And then we have um, our upload model and we have a single derived state of like when should we op uh, when should we show the open model button? And that is when the job is completed or the model already exists. Okay. Um, so looking through our implementation now, it's it's very much the same, only that we're now not checking on like individual state values, like uh, model name or something like that. We actually check on the state. So are we in an error state? Are we in a model exist state? Are we in a job completed state? So you get a much better sense of like, basically what state is this whole component as a whole in when I want to, to, to show uh, this UI or do something with this UI. In terms of the, um, the actual form, you could have decided to like have one idle form and then a form when you're not idle, meaning it's just completely locked down. But I chose to just um, keep the same form, but check the current idle state to, to, to reference the functionality of making changes. Uh, but that was just a decision by me. So that's how I'm doing that. Um, and then we can see to upload a model, it's disabled when you're not uh, idle and if you, uh, or if it has missing fields like the model. If it's busy, that's during the uploading or if the job is required. Now, um, let's see. Now we're moving to the implementation. So we have this idle function uh, and uh, the reason it's all uppercase is because it represents an explicit state. So we call this function and it takes a model by default that's empty. And the only thing we really need to do here is just return that explicit state where we use the current, like you can, uh, the reason we use current here is to create a union, right? So you can check current to figure out which state you're in but you can choose an, uh, another property name here. Uh, but it's idle, we have a model, and then we have the functionality for, uh, for the different uh, things you can do in this state. So update source, uh, 
does some checks on if you manually change the name and then creates like a default name. But as you can see, when we transition to new states, we just call set state and we call the explicit state with the data it needs. And the same for update name, update description, and so on. And then we go to the next state, uploading. Uploading takes the model that we're going to upload. And as I mentioned, it immediately runs that asynchronous piece of logic, uh, driving the state forward with either a success or an error. Where on success, we check if we have a job ID. And if we do, we move into the job required state or we move into the model exist state. If there's an error, we of course move into the error state. And as you can see here, it returns the uploading state itself. And then when the model exists, currently you can't do anything. Uh, we just return that state. Um, and then we have the job required state where again, it's exactly the same. Like we're calling a function, we're moving into a new state and we job completed an error. We're at the end of this. So the whole promise of like a finite state machine is to protect state changes, is to have predictable protected state changes. And the way a state machine does this is by having this declarative description of how you can move from one state to another with uh, what events. And then the internal implementation of the state machine ensures that those relationships are honored. But we just do it simply by creating these objects that has functions on them. And whenever you move to a new state, those functions aren't available anymore. So you literally can't call them. <laughs> uh, and that's how we protect it. And the benefit is that we also now, at the point of consumption of the specific state, we know what functionality is available to us. Um, great. And I think that was everything I wanted to say. Um, well, there was one more thing. You might feel uh, that adding functions to your state object is a bad idea. Uh, it isn't. <laughs> so normally when you do a use state, that you're updating that state, right? You're setting that state and you're updating that state. So it makes sense that um, you put the functions on the outside of use state, right? So that you can increment a value or even if you have an object as state, you're like just updating that same object. It represents a single state. But in this case, we literally have multiple states and each of those states have their own functions. So to be able to express that, we have to put the functions with the state itself. And that's perfectly fine. Um, so yeah, but I hope this made sense and um, I hope you at least got inspired or learned something new um, or got curious. Um, and as I said, the constructor pattern, that's something I would recommend to think about every time you feel you're done with a component, just to make it a little bit easier for the next developer to, to read that code. While the explicit states is something you would apply as a rule of thumb when you're doing something asynchronous in a component. Here it was quite complex, but it could be a simple like fetch mechanism uh, that could be handled with explicit states. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for tuning in and 